Chapter Twenty One of the Lure of the Labrador Wild by Dylan Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Twenty One, from Out the Wild. Donald and Allen returned at once to the log house on Grand Lake, leaving with the boys and me their tent and tent stove. Donald also gave me a pair of high sealskin boots with large, soft moccasin bottoms. It was their expectation that we should remain in camp until they got back with other things to aid my journey out, but although I was still very ill and the heated tent was comfortable, I found waiting irksome, and at daylight the next morning, Sunday, November 1st, the boys and I pulled up stakes. To protect my hands during the journey I made a pair of mittens from a piece of blanket duffel that had been brought back from the tent where Hubbard was. A pretty good path had been trodden in the snow by the trips of my rescuers up and down the valley, and following along it, with Duncan and Gilbert on their snowshoes ahead of me, packing it down still further, I did not sink very deeply. Nevertheless, such was the condition of my feet that every step I took was painful. As the boys carried all that was to be carried, I managed, however, to walk about ten miles during the day. We camped at a place where the four trappers on their journey in had catched a fat porcupine. For supper I ate a bit of the meat and drank some of the broth, and found it very nourishing. On the following day we met Donald and Allen as they were returning to aid us. Allen brought with him a pair of trousers to cover my half-naked legs. At sunset we reached the rowboat, which had been left near the mouth of the Susan, and as we approached Donald's log house something more than an hour later, a rifle was fired as a signal that we were coming. When we landed, George was there on the starlit shore to welcome us. I hardly knew him. His hair had been cut, he had shaved off his ragged beard, and he was dressed in clean clothing that Donald had lent him. He, of course, had heard of Hubbard's death from Donald and Allen, and when he clasped my hand in a firm grip to help me from the boat, he said, "'Well, Wallace, Hubbard's gone.' "'Yes,' I said, "'Hubbard's gone.' He was good enough to say he was glad I had escaped, and then in silence we followed the trail up to the house, the first human habitation I had seen for months. There was only one room in the house and there all of us, men and women alike, slept as well as ate. But it was scrupulously clean. The floor, table, chest, and benches had been scoured until they shone, and to me it seemed luxurious. The family did everything for me that was within their power. Donald gave me fresh underclothes, and his wife made me drink some tea and eat some rice and grouse soup before I lay down on the bed of skins and blankets they had prepared for me on the floor by the stove. My two days' walk had completely exhausted me, and I had a severe attack of colic and nausea. George then told me of his sufferings. Mrs. Blake, it appeared, had baked a batch of appetizing buns, and George, not profiting by his experience after his indiscretion on the night of his arrival, had partaken thereof with great liberality, the result being such as to induce the reflection, Have I escaped drowning and starving? only to die of overfeeding? The women of the household slept in bunks fastened to the wall, and while they prepared themselves for their night's rest the lamps were turned low and we men discreetly turned our backs. Just before this incident we had family worship, which consisted of readings from the Bible and the Anglican Book of Common Prayer in accordance with the usual custom of the household. Donald, our host, professed not to be a religious man, but never a day passed that he did not offer thanks to his maker. He regularly subscribed one-tenth of his income to the support of the Methodist mission. He would not kill a deer or any other animal on Sunday if it came right up to his door. His whole life and his thoughts were decent and clean, and he was ever ready to abandon his work and go to the rescue of those who needed help. It may be thought strange that he should observe the forms of the Anglican Church in his family worship and subscribe to the Methodist mission. The explanation is that denominations cut absolutely no figure in Labrador. To those simple-hearted people whose blood for the most part is such a queer mixture of Scotch, Eskimo, and Indian, there is only one church, the Church of Jesus Christ. 
and whenever a Christian missionary comes along they will flock from miles with the same readiness to hear whatever division of the church may claim his allegiance. So accustomed had I become to living in the open that I soon found the atmosphere of the closed room unendurable, and several times during the night I had to go out to breathe. I was down on the shore of Grand Lake for a breath of the crisp winter air when the sun rose. It was glorious. Not a cloud was there in all the deep blue vault of the heavens, and as the sunbeams peeked over Cape Corbeau the lake was set a-shimmering and the snow on the surrounding hills radiated tiny shafts of fire. It was to me as if the sun were rising on a new world and a new life. Our hardships and their culminating tragedy seemed to belong to a dim and distant past. What a beautiful world it was, after all! And how I thank God that I lived! Alan Goody had offered George and me the use of his sailboat in returning to Northwest River Post, and it was agreed that he and Duncan should row us over to his tilt on the Noscopy. So after breakfast George and I said good-bye to Donald and the rest of his household and three hours later were welcomed by Alan's wife. Again we received every attention that kindly hearts could suggest. We remained at Alan's two days while he and Duncan made a pair of oars and fitted up the sailboat for our trip to the post. With the soap and warm water and bandages provided by Mrs. Goody I was able to dress my feet. One foot especially had been affected, and from it I cut with a jackknife much gangrenescent flesh. It was on Thursday morning, November 5th, that George and I, warmly dressed in Donald's and Allen's clothes, set sail in a snowstorm for the post through the thin ice that was forming in the river. Upon reaching Grand Lake we found the wind adverse and the snow so thick we could not see our course, but after we had hovered about a fire on the shore until well into the afternoon the wind shifted to the west and the storm abated, enabling us to proceed a little farther on our journey or until signs of approaching night compelled us to take refuge in a trapper's tilt near Cape Block on the southern shore. This was the tilt that George, in his struggle out, had supposed he would have to reach to get help. It was about six by seven feet, and as it contained a tent stove we were able to make ourselves comfortable for the night after our supper of tea and bread and butter and molasses thoughtfully provided by Mrs. Goody. The next morning was clear and beautiful and although there was scarcely wind enough to fill the single sail of our little craft, we made an early start. Towards noon the wind freshened and soon was blowing furiously. The seas ran high, but George and I had become so used to rough weather and had faced danger so often that we ran right on in front of the gale, I at the tiller, and he handling the sail rope and bailing the water out when occasionally we shipped a sea. The rate at which we traveled quickly brought us to the rapid at the eastern end of the lake, and through this we shot down into the little lake, and thence through the strait known as the Northwest River, out into Grosswater Bay. It was about three-thirty o'clock in the afternoon when, turning sharply in below the post wharf, we surprised Mackenzie, the agent, and Mark Blake, the company's servant, in the act of sawing wood close down by the shore that they were astonished by the sudden appearance of the boat with its strange-looking occupants was evident. They dropped their cross-cut saw and stood staring. In a moment, however, Mackenzie recognized George, who, having had a haircut and a shave, looked something like his old self, and came to the conclusion that the other occupant of the boat must be I. He came quickly forward and, grasping my hand as I stepped from the boat, asked abruptly, "'Where's Hubbard?' dead i said dead of starvation eighty miles from here mark blake a breed but not related to donald took charge of george and as mackenzie and i walked to the post-house i gave him a brief account of hubbard's death and my rescue he had been warmly attracted to hubbard and his big heart was touched i saw him hastily brush away a tear taking me into the kitchen he instructed his little housekeeper lily blake mark's niece to give me a cup of cocoa and some soda biscuit and butter, while he made a fire in the dining-room stove. Lily cried all the time she was preparing my lunch. "'I feel so sorry for you, sir,' she said, "'and tis dreadful the poor man's starvin', and he were such a pretty man.' 
in the summer i says before you went to the bush sir he's sure a pretty man tis wonderful sad tis wonderful sad to have he die so oh that pleasant kitchen with the floor and all the woodwork scrubbed white and the rows of shining utensils on the shelves and the comfort of the great wood-burning stove roaring out a tune to us on that frosty winter evening as i sat there sipping the deliciously rich cocoa mackenzie joined me and while lily cooked the dinner i must tell him over and over again my story and in spite of herself the tender-hearted little housekeeper would cry and cry the dinner which consisted of grouse potatoes marmalade bread and tea was served in the dining-room which was also the living-room mackenzie sat at the head of the table i at the foot and on a lounge to one side sat Atikamish, a small mountaineer indian hunting dog gravely alert for the bones his master would occasionally toss to him. Atacamish had very good table manners. He caught the bones neatly and deftly, and he invariably chewed them up without leaving his seat or changing his position. My appetite was returning, and I ate well, but it was fully two weeks before I could eat without experiencing distress later. When that blessed time arrived I never could get enough. Lily was always pressing me to eat, and for a time I had at least six meals a day. After dinner Mackenzie got Mark Blake to cut my hair and shave off my beard. Then he took me to my room upstairs, where a stove was crackling out a welcome and a big tub of warm water had been prepared for me. After my bath he came again to rub my legs which were much swollen from frostbite and to dress my foot with salve. In a suit of Mackenzie's flannel pajamas I then went to my soft bed and lay snug and warm under the blankets. It was the first real bed I had lain in for nearly four months, and oh, the luxury of it! It is impossible for me to express the gratitude I feel towards those good friends. They nursed me with the tenderest care. Mackenzie's big Scotch heart and the woman's sympathetic instinct of the little housekeeper anticipated my every want, and he and she never could seem to satisfy themselves with doing things for my comfort. When I left the post with Hubbard I weighed one hundred and seventy pounds. A week after my return I weighed ninety-five. But with the care they took of me my general health was soon restored, and I rapidly put on flesh. My difficulties, however, were not yet ended. Hubbard's body was still to be recovered from the wild and repatriated, and during the long months that ensued before it could be reached, I lived in constant dread lest it should be destroyed by animals, until at length the dread amounted almost to an obsession. Moreover, the gangrene in my foot became worse, and if it had not been for the opportune arrival in that dreary land of an unfortunate young medical student, it in all likelihood would have killed me. End of chapter 21 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapter twenty two of the Lure of the Labrador Wild by Dylan Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter twenty two. A Strange Funeral Procession. The young medical student was George Albert Hardy of Prince Edward Island. Everybody called him doctor, and for all practical purposes he was a regular physician and surgeon for if he had been able to do two or three months more hospital work he would have received his degree. The reason he had hastily abandoned his studies and sought professional service with the lumber company that maintains camps at the western end of the Hamilton Inlet was that he had fallen a victim to consumption. He arrived at Northwest River Post on November 8th on a small schooner that brought supplies from Rigolette for Mackenzie and the Muddy Lake Lumber Camp at the mouth of the Grand River. The schooner remained only an hour at Northwest River, and Dr. Hardy had to continue on to Muddy Lake with her, but he found time to operate on my left foot, which was badly affected, and advised me how to continue its treatment myself. The doctor said that the mail boat, the Virginia Lake, which had carried him to Rigolette, would return there within three weeks for her last trip to Newfoundland of the season, and he urged me to take advantage of that opportunity to go home and get proper treatment for my feet. The temptation was great, 
but I felt it was my duty not to leave Labrador without Hubbard's body. It was my plan to engage dog teams and start with the body for the coast so soon as it could be brought to the post. Everybody agreed that it could not be recovered before January, and Mackenzie argued strongly against the practicability of transporting it with dogs, suggesting that we place it in the old post mission chapel until navigation opened in the spring when it could be sent home on the mail steamer. But I knew I must get home as soon as possible, and my mind was made up to take the body with me if I had to haul it all the way to Quebec. The great toe on my left foot growing steadily worse, it became necessary for me again to see the doctor. Grosswater Bay and Goose Bay by this time were frozen solid, and on December 4th I traveled to Muddy Lake, where Dr. Hardy was stationed, by dog team and Comatech, Willie Ikey, an Eskimo employed by Monsieur Duclos, the manager of the French trading post across the Northwest River, acting as my driver. Upon my arrival I was cordially welcomed by Mr. Sidney Cruikshanks, the lumber boss, Mr. James McLean, the storekeeper, and Dr. Hardy. It was arranged that I should stop and sleep with the doctor at McLean's house. The doctor did some more cutting, and under his careful treatment my foot so improved that it was thought I could with safety return to the post on December 15th to prepare letters and telegrams for the winter mail which was scheduled to leave there by dog team for Quebec on the 18th. It was the 20th before the mail got away, and with it went the first news of Hubbard's death to reach his relatives and friends. My dispatches, forwarded from Chateau Bay, the outpost of the Canadian Coast Telegraph Service, were received in New York on January 22nd, the letters two months later. Immediately upon my return to Northwest River my feet began to trouble me again. Word was sent to Dr. Hardy, who, regarding it as a call of duty, arrived on December 31st. I very much regret to say that, in responding to the call, Dr. Hardy received a chill that hastened, if it did not cause, his death. After examining my feet upon his arrival, he advised me to return with him to Muddy Lake. So it was arranged that George, with Mackenzie's dogs and Comatech, should drive Dr. Hardy and me to Kenemesh Lumber Camp, twelve miles across Grosswater Bay, where there was a patient that required attention, and that from there Hardy and I should go on to Muddy Lake with other dogs. Alas! the doctor never saw Muddy Lake again. Before starting I learned from Alan Goody and Duncan McLean, who came from the interior to spend New Year's Day, that Grand Lake was frozen hard and an attempt might be made to bring out Hubbard's body. Accordingly I engaged Duncan McLean and Tom Blake, also a breed, to undertake the task with George and to recover so far as possible the photographic films and other articles we had abandoned at Goose Camp and Lake Elson. Blake was the father of Mackenzie's housekeeper, and lived at the rapid at the eastern end of Grand Lake. As he had, at the request of friends, frequently prepared bodies for burial, it was arranged that he should head the expedition, while George acted as guide, and the agreement was that, weather permitting, the party should start inland on January the 6th. A coffin made by the carpenter at Kenemesh was all ready to receive the body when it should arrive at the post. George was to have driven Dr. Hardy and me to Kenemesh on January 3rd, but as there was a stiff wind blowing and the thermometer registered forty degrees below zero, we postponed our departure until the following day. The morning was clear and the temperature was thirty-four below. The dogs, with a great howling and jumping, had hardly settled down to the slow trot which with only fair travelling is their habitual gait, when we observed that the sky was clouding and in an incredibly short time the first snowflakes of the gathering storm began to fall. Soon the snow was so thick that it shut us in as with a curtain, and eventually even old Alanik, our leader, was lost to view. Bear well to the eastward and keep free of the bad ice. The sure to be bad ice handy to the Kenemesh had been Mark Blake's parting injunction. So George kept well to the eastward as hour after hour we forged our way on through the bending drifting snow. At length we came upon land, but what land we did not know. The storm had abated by this time, and a fresh comatic track was visible, which we proceeded to follow. On all sides of us ice was piled in heaps as high as a house. 
we had been travelling altogether about six hours, and the storm had ceased, when we came upon a tilt on the shore of a deep bay, and, close by it, a man making passes with a stick at a large wolf, which, apparently emboldened by hunger, was jumping and snarling about waiting for a chance to spring in upon him. The noise of our approaching comatic caused the wolf to slink off, and then the man hurried to the tilt, reappeared with a rifle, and shot the beast as it still prowled among the ice hills. He proved to be Uriah White, a trapper. Not at all excited by his adventure, he welcomed us to his tilt. In throwing off his mittens to fire his rifle at the wolf, he had exposed his naked hands to the bitter cold, and they had been frostbitten. While thawing out his hands at a safe distance from the stove, he informed us that he had been hand enough to he, meaning the wolf, to see that he were a she. The condition of my feet had not permitted me to leave the comatech during our long journey, and I suffered severely from the cold. George and, alas, Hardy, were also thoroughly chilled, though they had occasionally exercised themselves by running behind. Uriah prepared for us some hot tea and hardtack, and gave us our bearings. We were about four miles east of Kenemesh, and an hour later we arrived there. The lumber camp at the mouth of the Kenemesh River is composed of a sawmill, a storehouse in which also live the native helpers, a cookhouse, a part of which is given over to lodgings for the Nova Scotian lumbermen, and a log stable for the horses that do the general work about the camp and in the woods. Hugh Dunbar, the engineer, extended a warm welcome to the doctor and me, and his wife, who did the camp cooking, made us comfortable in the cookhouse. I was destined to remain at the camp for many weeks, and I cannot help testifying to the gratitude I feel to those lumber folk, especially Mr. and Mrs. Dunbar, Wells Bentley the storekeeper, Tom Fig the machinist, and Archie McKennon, Lay Stanton, and James Greenan. The chill he had received during the trip from Northwest River so affected Dr. Hardy that he was unable to proceed to Muddy Lake. Two days after our arrival he had a severe hemorrhage, and the following day another. This forced him to take to his bed, and thereafter he rose only occasionally for half an hour's rest in a chair. He was a deeply religious nature, and, realizing that he was doomed, he awaited the slow approach of death with calm resignation. And my feet steadily grew worse. Three days after our arrival at Kenemesh I could not touch them to the floor. The doctor and I lay on couches side by side. I could not even bear the weight of the bedclothes on my feet, and Dunbar built a rack from the hoops of an old flour-barrel to protect them. Under the doctor's direction, Mrs. Dunbar every day removed the bandages from my feet, cleansed them with carbolic acid water, and rebandaged them. Dunbar and the other men carried me in their arms when it was necessary for me to be taken from my couch. My temperature ran up until it reached one hundred and three and a half. The doctor then said that there was only one way to save my life, to cut off my legs. And, he added, I'm the only one here that knows how to do it and I'm too weak to undertake it. So we're both going to die, Wallace. There's nothing to fear in that, though, if you trust in God. The doctor was an accomplished player of the violin, but he had left his own instrument at Muddy Lake, and the only one he could obtain at Kenemish was a miserable affair that gave him little satisfaction. So while he lay dying by the side of his patient, who he thought was also dying, he, for the most part, gratified his love of music, and sought to comfort us both by softly singing in his sympathetic tenor voice the grand old hymns of the church. Lead kindly light, and nearer my God to me were his favorites, and every syllable was enunciated clearly and distinctly. But he was mistaken in thinking that I, too, was to die. Soon there was an improvement noticeable in the condition of both of my feet, and gradually they grew better. It's truly a miracle that the Lord is working, said the doctor. You were beyond human aid. I have prayed from the bottom of my heart that you get well. I prayed a dozen times a day, and now the prayer is answered. It's the only one of my prayers, he added sadly, that has been answered since I have been in Labrador. During January and February the cold was terrific. The spirit thermometer at the camp was scaled down to sixty-four degrees below zero, 
and on several days the spirit disappeared below the scale mark before eight o'clock in the evening. For a week the temperature never, even at midday, rose above forty below. The old natives of the bay said there never had been such a winter before. Not a man in the camp escaped without a frozen nose, and the cheeks and chins of all of them were black from being nipped by the frost. Bentley declared that he froze his nose in bed, and Mrs. Bentley bore witness to the truth of the statement. But Bentley's nose was frosted on an average of once a day. Nearly all of this time I lay at the lumber camp worrying about Hubbard's body. One day, late in January, when I had been hoping that the body had been safely brought out, Mackenzie and George arrived from Northwest River with the news that the storms had been so continuous it had not been deemed wise to attempt the journey inland. I wished to be removed at once to the post, thinking that my presence there might hasten matters, but Dr. Hardy said there would be no use of having two dead men and I was forced to be content under promises that the expedition would get under way as soon as possible. Early in February the doctor said I might try my feet on the floor. The result was the discovery that my knees would not bear me, and that I should have to learn to walk all over again. Recovering the use of my legs was a tedious job, and it was not until February twenty-ninth that I was able to return to Northwest River. After leaving Kenemesh, I never saw the unfortunate young doctor again, for he died on March 22nd. Back at Northwest River I was able to stir things up a bit, and bright and early on Tuesday morning, March 8th, George, Tom Blake, and Duncan McLean, composing the expedition that was to recover Hubbard's body, at last left the post, prepared for their difficult journey into the interior. I regretted much that my physical condition made it impossible for me to accompany them. Their provisions were packed on an Indian flat sled or toboggan, and their tent and other camp equipment on a sled with broad flat runners that I had obtained especially for the transportation of the body from some Indians that visited the post. At the rapid they were to get Tom Blake's dogs to haul their loads to Donald Blake's at the other end of Grand Lake. After that the hauling was all to be done by hand as it was quite impossible to use dogs in cross-country traveling in Labrador. In the course of the afternoon snow squalls developed, and all day Wednesday and Thursday the snow fell heavily. I knew the storm would interfere with the progress of the men, but I hoped they had succeeded in reaching Donald's and were at that point holding themselves in readiness to proceed. What was my disappointment then when towards noon on Sunday Douglas and Henry Blake, Tom's two young sons, came to the post that their father was at home. He had made a start up Grand Lake, they said, but the storms had not permitted the party to advance any farther than the Cape Corbeau tilt. Donald had accompanied the men to Cape Corbeau, which point it had taken an entire day to reach, as the dogs, even with the men on their snowshoes tramping a path ahead, sank so deeply in the snow that they could hardly flounder along, to say nothing of hauling a load. It was evident, therefore, that the dogs would retard rather than accelerate the progress of the party on Grand Lake, and when the Cape Corbeau tilt was reached on Tuesday night it was decided that Douglas should take them back to the rapid. On Wednesday morning the storm was raging so fiercely that it was considered unsafe to go ahead for the present. George, moreover, complained of a lame ankle and said he required a rest. So Tom came to the conclusion that if he remained at the tilt he would be eating the stock of grub to no purpose, and when Douglas turned homeward with the dogs he went with him. George and Duncan were to stay at the tilt until the traveling became better, Douglas said, and then push on to Donald's and wait for Tom there. Douglas's story made it plain that the weather conditions on Grand Lake had been fierce enough to appall any man, but as there had been no snow since Friday night I could not understand what Tom was doing at the rapid on Sunday and with Mackenzie's consent I had Mark immediately harness the post-dogs and drive me up to his house. I arrived there considerably incensed by his inactivity, but I must say that his explanation was adequate. He asked me if I had been able to see anything of Grand Lake, and made me realize what it meant to be out there with a high west wind of arctic bitterness drifting the snow in great clouds down its thirty-seven miles of unbroken expanse. There was no doubt that the men had done the best they could, 
and after instructing Tom that, if more provisions were needed, to obtain the McDonald's at my expense, and receiving from him an assurance that he would start again for Hubbard's body as soon as the weather would permit, I returned mollified to the post. It was on this day, Sunday, March 13th, that I received my first news from home and the outside worlds, Monsieur Duclos, who had been on a trip north, bringing me two telegrams from New York. They conveyed to me the comforting assurance that all was well at home, being replies to the dispatches I had sent in December. Received at Chateau Bay, they had been forwarded to me three hundred and fifty miles by dog teams and snowshoe travelers. Tom Blake started on Monday morning the 14th, and Tuesday at noon joined George and Duncan at Donald's. On Wednesday the three men began their march up to Susan. The weather continuing fair, they made good progress and had no difficulty in finding the site of our last camp. Hubbard's body, with the tent lying flat on top of it, was under eight feet of snow. Near the spot a wolverine had been prowling, but the body was too deeply buried for any animal to send it, and in its quiet resting place it lay undisturbed. It was fortunate that it had not been placed on the stage as I had suggested, for in that event it would undoubtedly have been destroyed. Continuing on inland, the men recovered the photographic films, the sextant, my fishing rod, and other odds and ends we had dropped on the trail as far back as Lake Elson. Tom and Duncan praised George unstintingly for the unvarying accuracy with which he located the things. With the country and smaller trees buried under a great depth of snow, and no landmarks to guide him, George would lead the other men on, and with no searching about or hesitancy, stop and say, we'll dig here. And not once did his remarkable instinct play him false. "'Tis sure wonderful,' said Tom in telling me about it. "'I ne'er could have done it, and no man on the Labrador could have done it, sir. Not even the mountaineers could have done it.' And Duncan seconded Tom's opinion. On Sunday, March 22nd, I was sitting in the cozy post-house wondering where George and the others were, when suddenly George appeared from out the snow that the howling gale was whirling about. My long suspense was ended. The body had been recovered in good condition, George said. Wrapped in the blankets that Hubbard had round him when he died, the blankets he had so gaily presented me with that June morning on the Sylvia and our old tarpaulin which George had recovered farther back on the trail, it had been dragged on the Indian sled forty miles down over the sleeping Susan River and thence out over Grand Lake to the Cape Corbeau tilt where the men had been compelled to leave it the day before owing to the heavy snowstorm that then prevailed. From the tilt the men had gone on to Tom's house at the rapid to spend the night, and George had now come down to the post to relieve my mind with the news that the body was safe. It was arranged that the next morning George and Duncan should take the post-dogs and Comatick, drive up to Cape Corbeau, and bring the body down. The morning was calm and fine, and they started early. It was a strange funeral procession that returned. The sun was setting when, on their way back, with the body lashed to the comatic, they passed over the rapid where Hubbard that beautiful July morning had sprung vigorously into the water to track the canoe into Grand Lake. How full of hope and pleasurable anticipation he had been when we paddled through the little lake. Over the snow and ice that now hid the lake, the seven dogs that were hauling his corpse strained and tugged ever and anon breaking into a trot as George and Duncan, running on their snowshoes on either side of the comatic, urged them forward with Eskimo exclamations or cracked their long whip over a laggard. No need to urge any one of them on, however, when they came in sight of the post. Darkness was falling. Knowing that their daily meal was near at hand, the dogs broke into a run and with much howling and jumping swung around the point and up to the buildings. End of chapter 22. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com. Chapter 23 of The Lure of the Labrador Wild by Dylan Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 23 Over the Ice. 
With the body at the post, it was my intention to hire dog teams, and, accompanied by George, start with it at once for home, traveling up Hamilton Inlet to the ocean, and then down along the coast to Battle Harbor, or some port farther south, where we might happen on a ship that would take us away from the land where we had suffered so much. More than three weeks elapsed, however, before we could get away from the Northwest River. It was about 325 miles over the ice to Battle Harbor, and Mackenzie and the others continued to argue against the feasibility of my plan. For a time it did seem as if it would be impossible to carry it out. First of all I had trouble with Hubbard's coffin. When we received the body the plain spruce box that had been made for it was found not to be deep enough. I sent over a request to James Greenan, the carpenter at Kenemesh, that another one be made as speedily as possible. He replied that the last board they had on hand had been used in making a coffin for poor Dr. Hardy, but said that if I would return to him the coffin we had, he believed he could raise the sides to the requisite height. Mackenzie immediately dispatched Mark with the dogs and Kamatik to carry the coffin to Kenemesh, and on April 4th it was returned with the necessary alterations. The body, meanwhile, had lain wrapped in the blankets and tarpaulin in a storehouse where the temperature practically was as low as it was out of doors. Now we placed it in the box with salt as a preservative, and everything was ready for our long journey. There arose the question as to where I could get dogs. Two teams were needed, one for the body and one for our baggage. Not a dog owner could I find who would undertake the task. I sent imploring messages for twenty-five miles around, but all to no purpose. They would not even undertake the ninety-mile journey to Rigolette. Some, I knew, did not like the idea of traveling with a corpse, and others, like Tom Blake, did not have enough dogs to haul our loads. In despair I went to Monsieur Duclos on April 19th and urged him to lend me his team to take us as far as Rigolette, telling him that Mackenzie was willing to let us have his team for the trip to Rigolette, but that another was needed. The French post-dogs had just returned from a long journey, and Monsieur Duclos said they were not fit for travel, but finally, to my great joy, he very kindly consented to let me have them, with Belfleur, a French Indian, as driver, after they had a couple of days' rest. It was Mackenzie's custom to make an annual trip to Rigolette on post-business, and this usually took place in May but he expedited his arrangements so as to be able to leave with us and thus save his dogs an additional journey. Belfleur arrived with his dogs early on the morning of April 21st. Unfortunately Fred Blake, Mackenzie's driver, was not on hand, but it was decided that Belfleur should go ahead with George in the coffin, and that Mackenzie and I should follow with the baggage the next morning. It was nine o'clock when the eight dogs that were to haul the two men in the coffin got under way. All the natives were sorry to see George go, his genial manners and cheerful grin having made him a prime favorite. Mackenzie's little housekeeper and Mark Blake's wife, who had been George's hostess, wept copiously. Mackenzie, Fred Blake, and I got off at six o'clock the next morning. Our seven big dogs were howling and straining on the long traces as I said good-bye to all the good friends that had been so kind to me and had gathered to see me leave. It took us until evening of the following day to reach Rigolette. The Eskimo dogs almost invariably leave a house and arrive at one with a great flourish, but between times they settle down to a gentle pace and have to be urged on with exclamations and much snapping of the whip. Ours were much better travelers than those belonging to the French post, and despite the fact that they had a heavier load to haul and were one less in number, we overtook George and Belfleur on the afternoon of the second day. A part of the time Mackenzie and Fred ran beside the Komatik on their snowshoes to get warm, but my knees were still so weak that I had to stick to the Komatik all the way. We spent the night at the log cabin of a breed, and before noon the next day came to the cabin of one Bell Shepherd, where we learned George and Belfleur had spent their second night. It is considered a gross breach of etiquette on the Labrador to pass a man's house without stopping for bread and tea, and so we had to turn in to see Bell. As he served us with refreshment he gave us a startling bit of news, to wit, that there was a great war raging in the outside world, with Great Britain, the United States and Japan on one side, and Russia, France, and Germany on the other. "'As sure tis true, sir,' he insisted, 
upon observing that Mackenzie and I appeared incredulous. "'I's just come from Rigolette, and Scott and Trader had the word by the telegraph to Chateau. So tis sure true, sir, and tis bad word for us poor folk on the Labrador, with the prices to go up as they tell me they sure will on flour and pork. We found out later that such a report had really spread up the coast from dog-driver to dog-driver until it had reached Rigolette, and it was not until I got to Battle Harbor that I learned that its basis was the beginning of the conflict between Russia and Japan. At Rigolette we were again hospitably received by Fraser, the factor. The news of Hubbard's death had preceded us. In fact, it had been carried up and down the coast, all the way from Cape Charles to Cape Chidley. Awaiting me was a letter from Dr. Clooney MacPherson of the Deep Sea Mission at Battle Harbor, who, I was informed, had recently been to Rigolette and had hoped to see me. The letter proved to contain much valuable information as to stopping places and the probabilities of getting dogs between Rigolette and Battle Harbor, as well as the good news that a steamer was expected at Battle Harbor early in May. I also learned from Fraser that Mr. Whitney, editor of Outing Magazine, of which Hubbard had been the associate editor, had sent a message to the telegraph operator at Chateau Bay requesting him to lend me every assistance possible and to spare no expense. Well meant, though the message was, it had the effect of increasing my difficulties. Duly exaggerated and embellished, it had spread up the coast until every dog owner gained the impression that a little gold mine was about to pass through his country. I found this out when I tried to get dog teams to carry me to Cartwright Post, the next stage on my journey. A haughty person named Jerry Flowers, it appeared, had a monopoly just then of the dog team business in the vicinity of Rigolette, and when we arrived at the post he proceeded to deal with me in the high-handed manner common to trust magnets. The regular rate paid by traders for transportation over the eighty-odd miles between Rigolette and Cartwright was from ten to twelve dollars a team, but for the two teams I needed Jerry expected me to pay him sixty dollars. While I was still arguing with the immovable Jerry, John Williams, an old livier, fortunately arrived from West Bay, which is halfway to Cartwright, and Fraser used his influence with John to such good purpose that he consented to take us with his dog team at least as far as his home at the regular rate. John had only six dogs, but he told us we should be able to get an additional team at William Mugford's two miles beyond Rigolette. The strait at Rigolette was open, and when, late in the afternoon of Monday, April 25th, we bade Mackenzie and Fraser farewell. George and I, with our baggage and Hubbard's body, were taken across through the cakes of floating ice in one of the company's big boats, manned by a crew of brawny post servants. On the other shore we loaded the baggage and coffin on John's comatic, and with him driving the dogs and George and I walking behind on snowshoes, we reached Mugford's at dusk. There we stopped for the night being served with the meals that the people all down the coast usually eat at that time of the year, bread and molasses and tea. With one or two exceptions we had to sleep on the floor at the places where we stopped, for the houses generally contained only one room divided by a partition. Almost all of the houses had low extensions used as a storage place, and there Hubbard's body would rest overnight. Never did we pay anything for our entertainment. Poor as the people are, they would be greatly offended if a traveler they took in offered them money. Generally speaking, we had good weather for our long journey to Battle Harbor and pretty fair going. Day after day we followed the coastline south, crossing from neck of land to neck of land over the frozen bays and inlets. Sometimes we encountered ridges on the necks of land, and then we would have to help the dogs haul the loads to the top. Resuming our places on the Comatics, we would coast down the slopes, with the dogs racing madly ahead to keep from being run over. If the descent was very steep, a drag in the form of a hoop of braided walrus hide would be thrown over the front of one of the comatic runners, but even then the dogs would have to run their hardest to preserve a safe distance between them and us, and out on the smooth ice of the bays we would shoot, to skim along with exhilarating swiftness. As we proceeded south we were interested in observing signs of spring. Towards the end of our journey we encountered much soft snow and water-covered ice. Mugford agreed to help us out with his four dogs as far as West Bay. Arriving there we found that only one team was procurable for the rest of the trip to Cartwright, 
so John Williams continued on with us all the way. Forty or fifty miles a day is about all that dogs can be expected to accomplish with average going, and we spent two days between Rigolette and Cartwright, reaching the Hudson's Bay Company post at Sandwich Bay on the evening of Wednesday, April 27th, to receive kindly welcome from the agent, Mr. Swaffield. Again at Cartwright we had some difficulty in getting dogs, and it was not until Friday morning that we could push on. These delays were exasperating, for I was bent on catching the steamer that Dr. McPherson informed me in his letter was due at Battle Harbor early in May. Our journey resumed, it was a case of fighting dog owners all the way. Seal Islands, about ninety miles farther down the coast, we reached on Saturday night, April 30th. There we had the good fortune to be entertained by a quaint character, in the person of Skipper George Morris, a native trader. He had been expecting us, and he greeted me as if I had been his long-lost brother. "'Dear eyes!' he exclaimed, wringing my hand in his buff cordial way. "'Dear eyes, but I's glad to see you. Wonderful glad!' The skipper's house was far above the average of those on the coast. It had two floors with two rooms each, and his good wife kept everything clean and bright. Soon after our arrival the skipper got out for our edification two shotguns, one single and the other double-barreled, each of which was fully six feet long from butt to muzzle, and had a bore of one and a half inches. "'The Boers have been fighting England,' said he, "'and I got em, the gun, to fight, sir. Dear eyes, if the Boers had come handy to us, I thinks I could have kept em off, sir. I knows I could with them guns. I'd sure have shot through their schooners, sir, if it was big as the mailboat and steamers like the mailboat. I have shot through em, sir, and the mailboat's a big un, sir, as you knows. The next day was May Day. I knew that at home the birds and flowers had returned, and that in dear old New York gay parties of children were probably marching to the parks. What a May Day it was on the Labrador! The morning ushered in a heavy snowstorm with a tremendous gale. Thinking of the steamer due at Battle Harbor, I suggested that, despite the storm, we might make a start but the skipper exclaimed, "'Dear eyes! And start in this gale? No, no, the dogs could ne'er face em, sir.' And as George and our drivers thought likewise, we spent the day resting with the old skipper and his wife, warmly housed and faring sumptuously on wild duck, while the storm outside seemed to shake the world to its very foundations. On May 2nd the snow had almost ceased falling, and the wind had somewhat subsided, when at eleven o'clock we parted from the quaint old skipper whose dear eyes continued to lend emphasis to his remarks up to the last that we saw of him. Rounding a point of land soon after leaving Seal Islands, we came suddenly upon two runaway dogs from a team that had been storm-bound at Seal Islands, like ourselves. The runaways were thoroughly startled by our sudden appearance and took to their heels with our teams composed respectively of ten dogs and twelve dogs after them. The ice we were on had been swept clear of snow by the wind, the hauling was easy, and our dogs almost flattened themselves out in their effort to get at the strangers and chew them up. The pace became terrific, but there was nothing to do but hold on tight and trust to luck. For perhaps five miles our wild ride lasted, and then, the strange dogs turning to the snow-covered land, our teams abandoned the race and condescended to pay some heed to their master's excited observations. Fortunately, the chase had carried us in the direction for which we were bound. Early in the afternoon we reached a cache of codheads and stopped while the dogs were fed one each. Poor brutes! They had had nothing to eat since Friday night, this was Monday, and I imagine a rather scant meal even then, for at this time of the year the stock of salt seal meat and fat and dried codheads and caplin that the natives put up in the summer and fall for dog food is nearly exhausted and what remains is used very economically. Often the dogs receive only one scanty meal every other day. Our drivers had intended to feed their teams at Seal Islands, but on account of the scarcity of dog food none could be purchased. At four o'clock in the afternoon we reached Norman Bay, where we found a miserable hut unoccupied, save by an abundance of filth, two cats, and one hen. As there were no tracks visible in the snow, the people had evidently been away since the storm began on Saturday night. We built a fire in the stove, made tea and fed ourselves, the cats, and the hen from our grub bag. 
I invariably insisted that our drivers travel as long as there was light, which at this season lasted until after eight o'clock, and we pushed on until we came to Corbett's Bight, a place that also rejoices in the name of New York, the same having been facetiously bestowed upon it by some fisherman wag, because four small huts had been collected there to make a city. The inhabitants of New York had all moved to their fishing quarters farther out on the coast when we arrived, and we took possession for the night of the best of the huts. Filth and slush lay an inch deep on the floor of the single room. A hole in the roof provided a means of escape for the smoke from the fire we built in an improvised fireplace, and, at the same time, a constant source of fear on our part lest some of the dogs which roamed at will over the roof fall through it and into our fire. An old bench and loose boards taken from a semi-partition in the room served as beds for our party, and we passed a fairly comfortable night. We were off at daylight, and at half-past eight that morning, May 3rd, reached William Harbor, where I had hoped to engage the teams of John and James Russell and proceed immediately to Battle Harbor, which place was now only a few miles off. But the Russells were away and did not return until night, so that we were unable to proceed until the following morning. With their teams of eight and six dogs, the Russells got us away early, however, and at half-past seven that morning, May 4th, we arrived at Fox Harbor, eight miles across the bay from Battle Harbor. Now a new problem presented itself, which was all the more exasperating for the reason that we were in sight of our goal. The ice pack was in the bay, and it was quite impossible to cross it until the wind might shift and blow the pack out. It is true that by a torturous trail some thirty miles around we could with dogs reach Cape Charles just below Battle Harbor, but none of the drivers that knew the trail was anxious to undertake the journey, and as the probabilities were that even if we did succeed in reaching Cape Charles we should be in the same fix there as we were here, our only course seemed to be to remain at Fox Harbor and wait. No vessel, they told us, had yet arrived either at Battle Harbor or Cape Charles. George Wakeman, an old English fisherman from Devonshire, who had spent forty years of his life on the Labrador and had an Eskimo wife, welcomed us to his house. Near it was an eminence called Watch Hill, from which the general situation of the ice pack could be observed. Day after day I climbed Watch Hill, and for hours at a time with a telescope viewed the ice and gazed longingly at Battle Harbor in the distance. On the morning of the ninth day the pack appeared to be spreading, and I decided to run the risk of getting fast in the ice and make at least an attempt to start. So George and I and the five natives that were to row us over got the boat afloat, prepared for a start immediately after luncheon. Meanwhile, George and I ascended Watch Hill for another look at the ice pack. Upon scanning the distant shore through the telescope, we discovered a speck moving in the bay away over near Battle Harbor. A little later we were assured that it was a big rowboat laboriously making its way through the ice. It came nearer and nearer, obviously headed for Fox Harbor. At noon it arrived, and its brawny crew of fishermen said they had come for us. Dr. McPherson had sent them. The steamer that the doctor had written he was expected had arrived at Cape Charles with a cargo for a new whale factory and probably would sail for Newfoundland the next day. Having heard we were on our way down the coast, and divining that we were held at Fox Harbor by the ice, Dr. McPherson had sent the boat so that we might be sure to get the steamer. I marveled greatly at these evidences of the doctor's thoughtfulness for us who were absolute strangers to him, and was deeply touched. We placed the coffin in the boat, together with our baggage, and started at once. The men had instructions to take us directly to the ship as she lay off Cape Charles, and after a row of about thirteen miles we reached her at five o'clock in the afternoon. She was the Aurora, one of the Newfoundland sailing fleet. It was like reaching home to be on shipboard again, and I felt that my troubles were ended. The mate, Patrick Dumfrey, informed me, however, that her commander, Captain Abram Keen, was at Battle Harbor, and that the steamer would not sail before the following night. So, wishing to have Hubbard's coffin prepared for the voyage, and to meet and thank Dr. McPherson, I had the men row me back the five miles to Battle Harbor. There I learned that, upon receiving the first news of my proposed attempt to bring out Hubbard's body, 
Dr. McPherson had made a special trip of twenty-five miles to Chateau Bay to telegraph to New York, suggesting that arrangements be made with Bowering and Company, the owners of the Aurora, to have that steamer pick us up at Battle Harbor. Perhaps I should say here that the kindness of the doctor to us was only what might have been expected from a gentleman by birth and breeding who, with his charming wife, buries himself on the desolate coast of Labrador in order to do his master's work. Pitiable indeed would be the condition of the poor folk on the Labrador, were it not for Dr. Grenfield and his brave co-workers of the Deep Sea Mission. For hundreds of miles along the coast they travel on their errands of mercy, braving the violent storms of the bitter Arctic winter, sleeping in the meanest of huts, and frequently risking their lives in open boats on the raging sea. Many is the needy one for whom they have found work, many is the stricken soul that they have comforted, and many is the life that their medical skill has saved. At the doctor's house I received my first letters from home, and the first accurate news of what had been transpiring in the outside world. While there I also met Captain Keene. Unfortunately the people in New York had not made the arrangement Dr. McPherson had suggested, but the captain assumed the responsibility of carrying us to Newfoundland, saying that we should go as his guest. He is a former member of the Newfoundland Parliament, and a man of influence as well as initiative, and it was lucky for us that he commanded the Aurora, else we, in all probability, should have had to push farther down the coast with dogs, or waited at Battle Harbor for the first appearance of the mailboat. The next day, Friday, May 13th, a firm of traders at Battle Harbor, under Dr. McPherson's supervision, lined Hubbard's coffin with sheet lead and sealed it hermetically. The body was still frozen and in good condition. In the afternoon we were taken to the Aurora by Dr. McPherson and a crew of his men, and established in the cabin while Hubbard's coffin was carefully stowed away in the hold, there to remain until it was transferred at St. John's to the Sylvia, the steamer on which my old friend, so full of life and ambition, had sailed from New York, and which now was to carry him back, a corpse. Because of a delay in getting her unloaded, the Aurora did not sail until Saturday evening. The sky was all aglow with a gorgeous sunset when we weighed anchor and steamed out of Cape Charles Harbor down across the Straits of Belle Isle. The night was equally glorious. As darkness fell the sky and sea were illuminated by the northern lights. There was no wind and the sea was calm. Close to our port side an iceberg with two great spires towered high above us. Another large iceberg was on our starboard. Before us Belle Isle and the French shore were dimly visible. Behind us the rocky coast of Labrador gradually faded away. End of chapter 23 Recording by Tom Weiss, tomsaudiobooks.com Chapter 24 of The Lure of the Labrador Wild by Dylan Wallace this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 24. Hubbard's Message. Our voyage from Labrador to Newfoundland was uneventful, and on Tuesday morning, May 17th, the Aurora steamed into St. John's Harbor. I was on the bridge with Captain Keene when we passed through the Narrows, eagerly looking to see if the ship was there that was to take us home. To my great satisfaction, the Sylvia was at her wharf, and George and I lost no time in presenting ourselves to my old friend Captain Farrell, her commander, who was engaged on deck when we arrived. He literally took me to his arms in welcome, and like everyone in St. John's, showed me the greatest consideration and kindness. Bowring and Company, the owners of the Aurora, placed at my disposal their steam launch and such men as I needed to aid me in the transference of the body from the Aurora to the Sylvia and they would make no charge for either this service or for our passage from Cape Charles to St. John's. On Friday morning, May 20th, the Sylvia sailed from St. John's, and one week later, Friday the 27th, with her flag at half-mast, steamed slowly to her dock in Brooklyn. It was a sad homecoming. Scarcely a year before, Hubbard, light-hearted and gay, filled with hope and ambition and manly vigor, had stood by my side on that very deck as together we waved farewell to the friends that were gathered now to welcome George and me back. 
I thought of how, when we were fighting our way across the desolate wilderness, he had talked of and planned for this hour, and thought of his childlike faith that God would take care of us and lead us safely out. And then I asked myself why George and I, whose faith was so much the weaker, had been spared, while Hubbard, who never lost sight of the religion of his youth, was left to die. I felt that I was the least deserving, and I lived, and Hubbard died. Why? I had no answer to the question. That was God's secret. Perhaps Hubbard's work, in the fullness of his plan, had been completed. Perhaps he still had work for me to do. We laid him to rest in a beautiful spot in the little cemetery at Haverstraw, at the very foot of the mountains that he used to roam, and overlooking the grand old Hudson that he loved so well. The mountains will know him no more, and never again will he dip his paddle into the placid waters of the river. But his noble character, his simple faith, a faith that never wavered but grew the stronger in his hour of trouble, his bravery, his indomitable will, these shall not be forgotten. They shall remain a living example to all who love bravery and self-sacrifice. The critics have said that Hubbard was foolhardy, and without proper preparation, he plunged blindly into an unknown wilderness. I believe the early chapters of this narrative show that these criticisms are unfounded, and that Hubbard took every precaution that could occur to a reasonable mind. Himself a thorough student of wilderness travel, in making his preparations for the journey he sought the advice of men of wider experience as to every little detail, and acted upon it. Others tell how fish nets might have been made from willow bark after the manner of the Indians, and describe other means of securing food that they claim men familiar with woodcraft would have resorted to. The preceding chapters show how impracticable it would have been for us to have consumed our small stock of provisions while manufacturing a fish net from bark, and how we did resort to every method at our command of procuring food. Unfortunately we fell upon a year of paucity. The old men of the country bore witness that never before within their memory had there been such a scarcity of game. But by far the most serious criticism of all, to my mind, is that against the object of the expedition. It has been said that, even had Hubbard succeeded in accomplishing everything that he set out to do, the result would have been of little or no value to the world. In answer to this, I cannot do better than to quote from the eloquent tribute to Hubbard's expedition made by his old college friend, Mr. James A. Leroy, in the magazine issued by the Alumni Association of their alma mater. Editorial wiseacres, says Mr. Leroy, may preach that such efforts as Hubbard made are of no great immediate value to the world, even if successful. But the man who was born with the insatiable desire to do something, to see what other men have not seen, to push into the waste places of the world, to make a new discovery, to develop a new theme or enrich an old, to contribute, in other words, to the fund of human knowledge, is always something more than a mere seeker for notoriety. He belongs, however slight may be his actual contribution to knowledge, however great his success or complete his failure, to that minority which has from the first kept the world moving on, while the vast majority have peacefully travelled on with it in its course. The unpoetical critic will not understand him, will find it easy to call him a dreamer. Yet it is from dreams like these that have come the world's inspirations and its great achievements. Without any trace of the finicality that so often is pure morbidity, Hubbard was the most conscientious man I ever knew, a man who was continually thinking of others and how he might help them. Doubtless some will see in his brave life struggle only a determination to win for himself a recognized place as a writer and expert upon out-of-door life. But those who were privileged to enjoy his intimacy know that the deep underlying purpose of the man was to fit himself to deliver to the world a message that he felt to be profoundly true, a message that should inspire his fellow men to encounter the battle of life without flinching, that should make them realize that unceasing endeavor and loyalty to God their conscience and their brothers, are indeed worthwhile. He died before reaching the goal of his ambition, but I do not believe that his message was undelivered. 
only men that have camped together in a lonely uninhabited country can in any degree comprehend the bond of affection and love that drew hubbard and me ever closer to each other as the labrador wild lured us on and on into the depths of its desolate waste the work must be done he used to say and if one of us falls before it is completed the other must finish it his words ring in my ear as a call to duty i see his dear brave face before me now i feel his lips upon my cheek the smoke of the campfire is in my blood the fragrance of the forest is in my nostrils. Perhaps it is God's will that I finish the work of exploration that Hubbard began. This is the end of The Lure of the Labrador Wild by Dylan Wallace. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks.com.